Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as uh, Heather just said, my name is Jim Fearon. I'm Vice President for Hayes in Western and Central Canada. Uh, I've worked for Hayes uh, for nearly 20 years now, my entire recruitment career. Uh, I've been lucky enough to do that across the UK, Australia, and more latterly the last six and a half years or so in Canada itself. Um, my sort of uh, hands-on recruitment career, I spent the vast majority of it focused um, on recruiting in technical disciplines such as construction, engineering, and oil and gas, and I now ran, uh, run our entire business in, um, in Western Canada. Um, so as, uh, as Heather said, we're going to have time for questions at the end of this presentation. Um, to help me answer those questions, um, I've uh, recruited the assistance of a couple of, um, a couple of Hayes' construction uh, experts, uh, Russ Carnley in our Vancouver office and Kirk Baker in Toronto. Russ has worked for Hayes for about 15 years. Uh, he's been working for us in Vancouver since we opened the office there in 2004 and has a wealth of knowledge on that market. And uh, Kirk has worked for us in Toronto for about five years now um, and uh, is our construction, our resident construction expert over there. So they'll be uh, with me to help answer any questions uh, I'll just uh, uh, say now, make an apology now. I'm a little bit under the weather, so if there's any coughing, coughing or spluttering as we go along, uh, then I do apologise. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, move on and have a look at um, our 2018 salary guide key findings. Uh, so this is our eighth annual salary guide, um, which gives us a lot of data to compare year on year. Uh, this year, more than 3,500 people took part in the survey, which is roughly the same as we have it had in previous years. Uh, the report covers 12 industries and functions, so there are insights for most organizations and people um, across the industries and across the country. Uh, in the report, you'll find information on competitive compensation and benefits, trends in recruitment and retention, as well as our analysis and recommendations based on today's labor market. I'm going to focus on two key things in this webinar. First is the key findings from the survey that cover the economic outlook, strength of the jobs market, and how all this will affect compensation and benefits plans. And secondly, we've picked out five key areas where we see there's a mismatch between what employers are offering this year and what employees are looking for. I'd say it's going to take us about 30 to 35 minutes to go through the findings. Okay, so let's get started and take a look at the economic outlook. And there's great news here. Uh, we saw a big uplift in economic confidence and business activity in 2017. This chart shows economic expectations. The dark blue line is the proportion of people who said the economy would strengthen in the year to come. And you can see that there was a big drop after the 2014 oil and gas downturn where the number of people who were, were optimistic was at almost the same level as those that thought it would weaken, which is the gray line. Then over the last three years, we've seen steady improvement, and this year, there are more people saying the economy will strengthen than there are saying it will, saying it will stay the same, which is great and probably means there are good things ahead. And then looking at how people are feeling about business activity, well, 60% of employees say, sorry, employers say business activity increased in 2017, which is up from 51% in 2016, and then looking ahead, uh, it's even more positive with 70% saying activity will increase again next year, which is fantastic to see. Canadian employers are optimistic and things are looking up. But what does the market look like for the construction industry? Well, looking at the same data specific to the construction sector, uh, this circle graph shows that 49% of construction employers say the economy is strengthening, which is even higher than the national average of 46%. And when we look at business activity, construction respondents report similar growth to the average in 2017 and are marginally more positive about the year ahead, with only 6% of people saying they expect a decrease of business activity in 2018. So it sounds like we've got a busy 2018 ahead of us in the construction industry. Um, and what does this mean for hiring? Well, starting with the overall results for all industries across uh, the entire country in permanent hiring. Um, this chart shows the percentage of, of employers that increased permanent headcount. So the light blue bar is what employers said they were planning on doing in that particular year, and the dark blue is what they actually did. So you can see two things here. One is how many companies were planning on increasing permanent headcount, and the other is how close they actually were to what they planned. And most years, employers are pretty close to their prediction. If a little bit below, 
in general, uh, but this year headcount growth increases actually outpaced expectations, which is a sign of how busy employers were over the year. And next year's prediction is higher again, higher than we've seen since 2014, in fact. So employers are definitely planning for more growth. Uh, but the really interesting story is in contingent or temporary and contract workers. Um, again, in light blue is what employers said they do, in dark blue is what they actually did. Um, in 2017, you can see that the number of companies that actually increased their contingent workforce was more than double that that had predicted they would do so, if that makes sense. And that's a huge jump that we hadn't expected to see and tells me really that people didn't realize just how busy they were going to be or they didn't match up the amount of resources they were going to need to meet their business needs in 2017. And in 2018, 26% of employers are expecting to hire more contingent workers. Okay, so on the whole, business activity is up and hiring activity is on the up. Um, is this the same in construction across Canada? Well, yes it is. In fact, it's even busier. So for 2017, 40% of construction companies reported increased permanent hiring, with 50% expecting to do so in 2018, and only 5% predicting a decrease. When you bear in mind the ongoing skills shortage that everybody reports year on year, um, I'd say that's going to present a pretty significant challenge to a lot of companies. Looking at temporary staffing, once again, the use of contingent workers was high in 2017, although expectations are lower next year and more in line with the overall results, with most employers saying they'll keep the same contingent workforce levels. Um, so it looks like construction leaders are hoping to be able to hire full-time instead of relying on contingent workers to meet project deadlines, or I guess you could interpret as if they're more confident in committing to permanent headcount. So nationally, hiring is up, and in construction, that jumps even higher, especially for full-time headcount. Um, let's look at what that means for compensation. Uh, well, salaries are moving, uh, but I'd say they're moving very slowly indeed. Um, if you look at this chart, this is the total number of employers increasing salaries each year. The dark blue bar represents the number of employers increasing salaries by less than 3%, and in light blue is those increasing by more than 3%. So looking at this trend line, since 2012, the number of employers increasing salaries by more than 3% has dropped by half, and you have a corresponding proportion increasing salaries by less than 3%. So economic confidence is high, business activity is increasing year on year, employers are ramping up permanent hiring, but this isn't yet translating into any materials, materially significant salary increases, rather they're getting increasingly conservative with raises more in line with inflation. However, this trend we believe is starting to cause some pressure in the jobs market. And here are a few stats for you to think about. So 41% of employees say they are not being paid market rate. Now you might say that most employees are going to say that if asked, um, but we asked the same question last year and the response was only 32%. So that's a very significant increase for one year. Uh, next. 40% of managers have increased a one-off salary offer, sorry, have increased a one-off salary offer to secure the right person. Uh, HR is also worried about salaries. They told us that their biggest competition for talent comes from companies that can pay more. And on top of that, 41% of HR leaders say they either have changed or will change compensation plans to attract talent. And that's increased from just 25% last year. So another very significant shift. Now, if you look at all of the information on the slide at the moment, it appears as though we are taking a two-speed approach when it comes to compensation, when you can, which you can interpret a little bit like we're taking a very conservative approach to retaining our existing staff, but we're taking an increasingly aggressive approach to attracting staff. And we'll break our own salary levels or salary rules or bandings to get the right person. When you add in the piece about 41% saying they think they're underpaid, we think you potentially have a significant problem in 2018, and that's that there's little more upsetting to an employee than when someone comes in at a similar level to them, but they're on a higher salary, and unfortunately, no matter what you do, that piece of information always seems to manage to worm its way out. Um, and we, we strongly believe this isn't a sustainable approach for employers in Canada in 2018. Uh, if we're in an employer's market with lots of available talent, then that, uh, talent, then that might be fine. Um, lots of candidates, easier hiring, staying competitive uh, isn't as important, 
but unfortunately we're not in that position at the moment. Okay, so what about in construction? Um, this is comparing how salaries changed last year with what employers expect next year. So construction was less likely than average to increase salaries at all, with one-third saying compensation plans stayed the same. Um, but when they did increase salaries, employers were, were most likely than average to increase by more than 3%, which is great news. Although, looking ahead, you can see that only, uh, that, sorry, that 70% of employers plan to keep salaries either at the same level or offer increases of less than 3% in 2018. So having said all that, please also keep this in mind. 85% of construction employers say their industry suffers from a skill shortage, which is considerably higher than the national average of 72%. On top of that, 69% of employers say the skill shortage is negatively affecting productivity, and a huge 75% say it's negatively affecting employee stress and work pressure. So your employers are stressed out and feel high pressure because teams have to maintain or increase productivity without the resources they need. Um, now, what's causing the skills shortage? And we ask this question a lot um, to keep up with trends. Well, the number one reason continues to be that fewer people are ent entering the market. This is followed by a lack of training and development, which saw an increasing number of responses on last year. Um, the third highest response was retirement. Um, this is higher than the national average. Um, for construction, uh, indicating it's a bigger issue for this industry than others. Uh, behind retirement is people leaving to join other industries, and then finally people relocating to other regions. What I want to talk about here is, that, is how the top three interact. So fewer people are entering the construction industry, and, at, and at, at the same time as more and more people are reaching a retirement age, and this means the skills gap is only going to increase. You have senior people leaving, but you don't have enough people coming in behind them to replace them. Now, one way to bridge that gap could be with training and development, albeit that's an issue of its own. And I guess the question for employers to think about is how are they proactively providing their workforce with the necessary training and development to reduce the impact of a knowledge drain rather than relying on employees, schools, or government bodies um, to come up with uh, training and development solutions. Um, all these all these causes are leading to one issue, we think, which is big challenges and difficulty in hiring the right people. Okay, so next, 83% of construction managers say they struggle to hire, and the number one reason for that is a shortage of good applications. From our research into what candidates are looking for, we know that at any given time, less than one in 10 of potential candidates are proactively or actively job hunting. But nine out of 10 would accept the right offer if it happened to come along. Now that's, in, that's increased 15% since 2013. So candidates are more open to moving now. There's more confidence or renewed confidence in the job market. But despite that willingness to move, if you're just relying on applications uh, or people responding to adverts you're running, um, you're missing out on most people who would be interested in your job because most of them aren't looking at adverts. Um, but it also means that if you can put the right offer in front of somebody, then there's a greater chance now that you're going to get them to accept it. Um, so you need to be connecting with those candidates, finding and engaging your target audience so when you have an open position, you're not just relying on people visiting job boards and seeing your jobs. If you're not making the right offer to the right person, you're missing out on top talent. And on the other side of the coin, if you're not actively focusing on retention, then your top employees could also be open to an offer from a competitor, and they may be more compelled now than ever to consider it. Um, but that also requires you to know what people actually want. And we surveyed thousands of candidates um, asking about what keeps them in a job and what attracts them to a new role. And we're seeing a lot of mismatches between uh, what works to attract and retain employees and what employers um, are actually doing or offering. So first I wanted to look at some top line findings about employee priorities, then look at what some of the missteps are that I think employers are making and what you can do instead. Uh, let's look at employee and candidate priorities. So at the top here is what attracts candidates to the role, um, or to a new role, I should say. In blue is salary, then, uh, sorry, in dark blue is salary, then moving right is career growth, 
culture and benefits. If you compare this second chart, sorry, if you compare that to the second chart, you can see that salary and benefits becomes marginally less important when it comes to retention, while career and culture become more important. The most important takeaway from these charts is that salary is the single biggest factor for both attraction and retention, um, but it's outweighed by career growth, company culture, and benefits as a whole. A second interesting finding from this data um, was that Canadians are more likely to say they would take a pay cut for their ideal job than so they would take a step down in seniority, which shows the importance of career progression. You might already have spotted some mismatches between what you thought people wanted and what the results show, so let's look at some detail uh, as well as what actions you could take to realign. Um, so now we're going to talk through those sort of five areas I mentioned at the beginning where we think we see a mismatch between what employers think employees want and what employees are telling us they want. Okay, first up, let's talk about salary, as it's clearly a growing concern. So 42% of construction employers say companies that can pay more are their biggest competition for talent. So 42% of construction employers say companies that can pay more are their biggest competition for talent. And when we look at construction specifically, only about half of employees um, say they are paid the market rate. On top of that, more than half of managers are increasing salary offerings to secure a specific candidate, which is a potential problem, as previously mentioned. In fact, about one in 10 managers say they've increased salary offerings to more than a quarter of their new hires. So some companies could be seeing a lot of hiring done with salaries offered above their existing staffing levels. Um, now, we definitely recommend that you're having to do that this much, um, then it could be a sign uh, that you need an extensive salary review to ensure your salary bands align with the market, whether it's across your whole organization or just in specific disciplines. Um, we saw before that only 28% of employers are increasing salaries by more than 3%. At 46% of HR professionals have to plan or adjust the compensation, sorry, have or plan to adjust compensation plans to attract talent, or to put it another way, 54% do not plan to do so in the next 12, mo 12 months, but the next 12 months looks like, it looks like it's going to be very competitive and very busy from a hiring perspective. So there are major concerns about salary competitiveness and competition, um, but there are comparatively few plans to address it. So what can you do? Well, it's important that you're at least meeting market expectations, and how can you do that? Well, first, Use all your resources to make sure you know what market rate is. Uh, refer to our salary guide, talk to your recruitment consultant, work with a, an association or other expert to find out what trends are happening in the market. Knowledge is definitely half the battle here, and if you find that some salaries are below market rate, put a plan in place to increase them. Um, it doesn't need to be immediate, that's, and that's often not possible anyway, but make sure you have a plan, and I would suggest talking to your employees about that plan so they know you've gathered the information and are taking some sort of action. Otherwise, it looks like you don't care that some salaries may lag market rate, and that's a quick way to disengage good employees. Next, uh, review salary bands as positions become open, especially if it's been a few years since you filled those sorts of roles. Um, in many cases, you may find that the salary, your salary range is still similar, uh, or the salary range is still similar, I should say, but if you consistently review salaries when hiring, then you'll be able to keep up with market changes. And finally, don't compete on salary alone. Only one company can actually pay the most, and it's other job factors that will really set your company apart from the crowd. Okay, so looking at benefits, there's a lot of opportunity here, I think. Um, let's look at what employers think matters most for recruitment and retention. So we asked HR professionals and managers to rate the benefits they thought were most important to their employees, and they were flexible work hours, individual performance-related bonus, the ability to work from home, pensions or RRSP, and lastly, training or certification support. However, when we ask the same question of employees, it might surprise you to know that only one of these, sorry, excuse me, only one of these was in um, the top five for candidates, and only three are actually in the top 10. Uh, so what do candidates or employees want? Okay, it's all about personal and professional development here, really. So three of the top five for candidates are training-related, compared to just one for, of employers, 
and we did use the same list. So HR had as many training related options on their list, or HR managers. Um, they just didn't think they were as important. So pension and RSP matching within a candidate's top 10, but it looks like very few candidates are getting the training and develop, uh, development support they want. And flexible work or work from home options aren't enough to outweigh uh, that thirst for new knowledge and development. Before we leave this slide, I'm sure some of you noticed that health, dental, and extra vacation aren't on the list above. Uh, more than two thirds of employers offer these benefits. So at this point, we think, sorry, we're seeing these as table stakes, like they have to be there. Um, they're not a differentiator in the market unless you're not offering all three um, to your existing or potential employees. Okay, so what can you do to better align with market expectations? Well, my first stop would always be to talk to your employees. What do they want? Um, a simple survey sent out company-wide can help you get the insights you need so you can prioritize the areas um, where there's most dissatisfaction or the biggest push for change. Uh, again, I suggest using all your resources to determine, to determine market expectations and candidate priorities. Uh, this salary guide is a good starting point. Our recruitment consultants talk to hundreds of candidates a year in your industry or, or function, so they really have frontline knowledge of these skilled professionals, uh, sorry, of what these skilled professionals are looking for. And then finally, when you're making changes, prioritize those, wanted, those most wanted benefits first. So making a big deal about introducing free snacks won't help if all your employees really want time off and loot. So find out what your employees want, find out what the market wants, and then incorporate those into your plans and communication. Now, as I said before, 90% of people would leave their current role for the right job offer, even those who are pretty happy with their current role. So what would make a happy employee accept an offer? Well, the number one reason that a happy employee would consider a job offer for is career progression. It's the second most important aspect of weighing a job offer, and it's the biggest pull factor you have to try and bring in a candidate who didn't think they were job hunting until they got your message about a potential opening. However, only 57% of employers are promoting career progression to attract top talent. It's one of the lowest on the list, so if you're not telling candidates about the career opportunities um, they, or about your career opportunities, they very possibly won't be interested in your jobs, even if it would be a good fit in other ways. Okay, a second mismatch I see is what employers think career growth means compared to what employees are actually looking for. So these are the top five factors contributing to career growth according to Canadian workers. Some of those might fit what you thought people wanted, such as training courses and internal job opportunities, but a lot of candidates are looking for, rec uh, for recognition, variety in projects, and top of the list, a good relationship with their boss is key for career growth. So think about whether you're supporting people across all of these areas when you think about career growth. It's not just about job titles and promotions, increasing responsibility, learning new skills, and internal recognition are all important parts of career progression too. So when you're trying to attract the best and brightest, emphasize the career opportunities, it's the main reason ambitious people will leave their jobs. And I think a lot of employers are put off by the idea of career growth because they think it's about a focus on promotions and salary increases. Um, but think, try to think beyond these tired cliches because that's not what most people are looking for when they talk about career progression. Most people are looking for genuine opportunities to learn new things, uh, do different tasks, and increase their responsibility. To that end, in, introduce programs such as mentorship, job shadowing, and lunch and learns to make the most of the existing resources in your organization. This has two benefits. One, you're offering the professional development uh, that people are looking for, and two, you're keeping that knowledge in the organization, making sure it's passed on to your future company leaders. Finally, target the candidates you're looking for. Career growth is most important to junior and intermediate candidates, many of whom are Gen Y, so when advertising those types of roles, it's especially important to emphasize career growth opportunities. Okay, let's quickly talk about culture. People rate culture as more important for staying in a job than for evaluating an offer, so it's a very important retention tool. What's more, when people say they're unhappy in their current role, they list company, com <coughs> excuse me, they list company culture as the number one reason they'd consider another job. That makes sense. 
If it's not a good cultural fit, then sorry, that makes sense. If it's not good, a good cultural fit, then that is likely going to make them unhappy at work, which will motivate them to look for another career opportunity. Career is the biggest pull, but culture is the biggest push, if that makes sense. So culture should be top of mind when it comes to retention, but only 13% of employers recognize culture as a retention challenge. The top concerns for employers when it comes to retention are salary and career growth, but of those but of but 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 those of those matter a lot. But although sorry, although those matter a lot, they're they're both big pull factors that can attract someone. So I'm not suggesting you lose sight of those. However, culture is the biggest push factor, and if you don't have a good culture, then your employees aren't going to stick around, even if you have the salary and career options they want. But what is good culture, and how do you get it? Well. Focus on the core tenets of culture. So across all demographics, employees say the most important aspects of culture are open communication, strong leadership, and work-life balance. That's it. It's not about pool tables or beer fridges. Um, employees want to work somewhere where there is clear open communication. They want strong company leadership they can trust, and they want an employer that respects and recognizes their efforts at work and their, and their needs in their personal lives. Um, these aspects are harder to achieve um, than some of the flashier pieces, but employees won't be swayed by superficial gimmicks like perks and office toys if it's covering up the fact that the company doesn't have a strong core. I suggest surveying your employees about your culture. Um, Hayes has an annual survey called the Talkback Survey that we take seriously, and every year we introduce changes based on feedback. Um, it makes sure we always know what people are prioritizing, what's working and what's not, and as demographics change, we can adjust to keep up. And it's a crucial part of our attention strategy and we tr strongly believe it works. Okay, the last four points that we discussed are really about what you do, what you offer, and what your work environment's like. Well, now I want to switch gears a little and talk about how you communicate, uh, what you promote, and who is listening. Because you could be the best employer in the world, offer all of the right things, have incredible career paths, and if, but if you don't tell anyone about it, then you'll struggle to attract people. Now, lots of employers so that they're promoting their company culture to attract talent, it's the num and, it, and that is actually the number one approach this year, but I'm not sure that companies are getting this right. So managers tell us their biggest issue is getting enough good quality applications. To me, that's a network issue, and you're either getting tons of poor quality applications, um, so you're reaching the wrong people, or you're not getting very, very many good applications, which means you're not, re you're not actually reaching enough people. Um, and more than a third of construction leaders say that the lack of candidate network is a major recruitment challenge, so there's alignment here. And 40% of construction leaders say that target candidates don't know who their company is. Now, everyone is promoting culture, but no one is right reaching the right people, so here you actually promoting your culture too. And then less than half of employers have a defined employer value proposition. So half don't have any clearly defined message about why people should work for them. That means they're promoting culture with inconsistent and mixed messages, and then you're probably not talking to your target candidates anyway. All right, so this is complicated and confusing, and what can you do about it? Well, first of all, I'd encourage every employer, no matter how small, to take time to find your employer value proposition. Um, why should somebody want to work for you, and why do your existing staff continue to work for you? Um, what do your current employees like, and what sets you apart from your competition? This is a great exercise in, in defining your company culture and clarifying both internal and external messaging for recruitment and retention. Without an EVP, your target, your target candidates are receiving mixed messages. Next, identify your target candidates and build your network by sharing a relevant and timely content. This is the best way to engage those candidates so they know who you are and what you do, and when it comes time to hire, you already have a pool of interested, qualified candidates. And then finally, develop an internal communication plan as well. You want all your employees to know why they should stick with you, what you offer them that other employers don't, and regular internal communication keeps people engaged, which will improve retention. Okay, so those are our key findings and recommendations. I'll briefly recap. Um, and then show you how you can take action today to start some of these improvements. Okay, so what have we talked about? 
<coughs> confidence and business activity are increasing, hire, are, increasing, um, are increasing hiring, but compensation changes remain nominal. Employers may be focusing on the wrong things for recruitment and retention. Compensation matters, but it's outweighed by culture and career growth. If you're not communicating about your programs, then you're missing an important attraction and retention tool. And here are four things you can do today to better align with what your employees and candidates want. So compare your team or organization's salaries to market rate. Start by talking to your recruitment consultant or reading the salary guide. Start a conversation with your employees about what they like and don't like at work so you can target areas for improvement. Find and engage with your target candidates instead of waiting for them to come to you. And then lastly, grow your network, join a LinkedIn group, connect with an association, and start developing some sort of content plan so you can get into dialogue um, with your target audience. Okay, that's pretty much everything that we have for you today. Uh, so these insights came from the latest salary guide and is mixed with um, um, insights from other uh, research that we do. The salary guide is officially launched in January, uh, but you can get an advanced copy by contacting your recruitment consultant or emailing our marketing department uh, at marketing at haze.com or you could email myself jim.furin at haze.com uh, and you can also visit haze.ca forward slash resources um, for all of our research and reports that we've done over the years. Um, so as I said at the beginning, um, we've got time for questions now. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening. I really appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box. Um, I've got Russ and Kirk on the line to help me um, with any regional specific or technical questions. Um, so let's see whether we have anything. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to see whether anything comes through. Uh, like I said, thank you very much for joining me today. <coughs> okay. Uh, we definitely have something coming through here. Um, right, this is quite a common question. Um, it's about the complicated topic of communication. Um, when you say you have a content plan, uh, what does that look like? We have a marketing team, but I don't think they have uh, content specific to employment. Um, so that's a fairly common question that we get, and uh, I'll, I'll answer that myself. I'll see whether Kirk and Russ have any insights themselves after. But um, that's a fairly common conversation that we have with clients, um, and it's perfectly natural for your marketing department to be focused on talking to customers or clients um, and not necessarily target candidates or um, future employees. Uh, your, your marketing department is trying to help you sell product or to win your projects, uh, not necessarily uh, hire people. Um, but what that, that, what that can mean is your target candidates actually don't have anything to engage in with you, or you can't, um, or, you, or when you're trying to engage with them, you don't have anything to talk to them about. So you actually specifically need to go about developing a content plan. Um, so I'd say, like, how do you identify um, your target audience? How do you figure out what they're interested in? Um, and the important thing is sharing regular um, and a variety of content, such as blogs um, or news articles, to engage people in. It could be that you're developing um, a network of candidates, and as and when you win projects or complete projects or hand them over to clients, you're communicating to potential um, potential candidates or to your network about those things. It could be that you're um, interviewing your existing employees about why your organization is a good place to work, what they like about working there, and then sharing that information um, with your networks. Um, it's obviously also very important to make sure that you're on the right platform. So are you on the right social media networks? Do you have a LinkedIn page for your organization? Are you, are you um, hooked up with the correct groups in your geography or across certain disciplines. Um, so it's, it's, it's not unnatural not to have a lot of content. It's also not that hard to come up with some relevant stuff. Um, but the really key thing is, do you have a network to share things with? Uh, we, we, we actually um, offer clients um, free consultation services on this, and we often go out and have our marketing department go and present to, to clients about how to do this. Uh, we also have a number of products that we 
offer to help our clients do this and leverage our own network, uh, one of them being an employer brand accelerator, which we do on a regular basis um, with clients that um, need exactly this um, problem solved. Uh, I don't know, uh, Kirk, whether, or, or Russ, whether you have anything to add to this at all? Um, yeah, I'd just like to add, I think, in terms of the EBA uh, that you just mentioned there, I know um, that's a, a campaign which we've run for a number of companies across a number of different industries, but very successfully here in the GTA, um, specifically uh, more so within the, the construction industry, the property industry, and the architecture industry also. So, uh, again, as, as you said, if that's something that's going to a aid um, you guys getting your message out there, then by all means reach out to, uh, to your relevant consultant. Thank you, Kirk. Russ, anything? Um, yeah, well, it's, it comes down to developing the employer value proposition, but doing that also has a secondary effect as well. Like if you're interviewing staff are well briefed in terms of what the pitch is, in terms of why um, someone should join you, then it's not just getting the person through the door, it's actually having a successful interview and, and knowing what to sell to the person that you sat across the table from. So um, it does help with getting people through the door, but it also helps with actually securing those people because so many people, so many candidates go for interviews and then leave um, and not wanting to pursue the opportunity. And sometimes that's just a case of the messaging that was presented during the interview. So it's definitely worth investing the time and effort in because it might be like a, a double, um, double whammy in terms of the impact on your business. Right, so like making sure you're prepared to pitch your organization in the appropriate way when you've got the target candidate in front of you. Exactly, yeah, and it's worth looking at some stats in terms of how many candidates you're getting through the door um, versus how many are coming um, on board um, and, and monitoring that statistic to see how successful your interviewers are in, uh, in pitching the opportunity. Yeah, fair enough, I think that's an excellent point, well made. Uh, we've got one other question here. We currently have a salary freeze uh, that's going to end in March. Um, I've already had a couple of people leave in the last six months. How can I hang on to people I have until we can offer um, changes in salaries? Um, and I'd say that's a, a fair question. Um, I think the important thing is to say, well, if, you, if, you, if you're going to be reviewing salaries in 2018, then probably now is an opportune time to convey that message to um, to your business. You don't have to be committing to, to increases. Um, but I definitely suggest that ensuring that they're aware that it's on the agenda um, will go some way to sort of alleviating concerns. Um, but then I'd also say just think through the things that we've talked about. So salary definitely isn't everything, um, and you have to think about all the other reasons why people work for you. Um, absolutely 100% at the top of that list should be um, um, career development. Um, do people know where they sit in your succession plan? Do you have a succession plan that you communicate to the business? Um, are you con continuously trying to develop your office culture and making people aware of the things that you do to improve culture? Are you developing relationships with people as, um, as, uh, as their leader and, and making sure that you're spending time talking to them about their personal development needs and where they want to go in the organization and genuinely and generally making them feel like they're going somewhere, and I think there's things that you can do that are, again, not complicated, they're largely completely free, um, that are simply about spending time talking to people about the things that are important to them, um, and making sure you're ticking the boxes that you can tick whilst you can't do anything about salaries. Um, so, um, so, so that would be the sort of summary of what I'd say, and I don't know, again, Kirk or Russ, have you got anything to add to that? Um, um, I do. I mean, you, be, yeah. being at the front end of, of recruitment and sitting down with candidates, obviously very regularly, um, it is um, very infrequent that salary is, is the main thing that people um, are kind of um, messaging to us as their primary reason for moving. So just to agree with exactly what you've said, Jim, like there's so many other things to talk about and it's having that open open dialogue. So at least if people do have things that are important to them, you know what those things are and that it's all out in the open, like putting your head in the sand and hoping it'll just go away is definitely not the way to, to go. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, I think um, obviously as we're, we're coming into the holidays now and um, you know, I think now's a good time to, you know, really 
focus on the, the company culture. Obviously, there'll be Christmas parties as such coming up. So, you know, things like this, whilst they're, you know, they're certainly going to contribute towards, um, you know, gen building a, a good culture, a good team building um, exercises. Um, and just the second point that I just wanted to, to, to make is, you know, whilst you're going to be reviewing your salary reviews, uh, sorry, reviewing your salaries um, in, in March time, um, Certainly consider reaching out to your consultants again, discuss what's going on in the market at that point, um, just make sure that you're um, on, on the right sort of um, in level, on level with your comp competition. And of course, we've got the salary guide coming out as well, um, which is obviously going to be a great resource for you in terms of uh, benchmarking yourselves against um, your competition. Mm. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's actually all the questions we've got. I'd probably just like to summarise Again, it's, this is, a, a, I think, a really important time for the industry. We're, we're in our second consecutive year of, um, of, of very positive and increasingly positive economic outlook. 2018 looks extremely good um, in all places. Like Alberta is also starting to come out of, um, it's not like charging out of the slump, but certainly people are more positive here. So we don't really have a part of the market where there's negativity. Um, all companies, virtually all companies, are expecting business activity to increase next year. Uh, we have a skill shortage in the construction industry. Uh, virtually all of us are planning on hiring, sorry, increasing our permanent headcount hiring. And if you don't have absolute clarity around what your strategy is from a compensation, benefits, career development, and cultural perspective, and how you're going to communicate to the market, you could really self find yourself sort of out in the cold, per se. Um, in the, in, the new, in the new year as companies ramp up and you could run the risk of losing your high value existing employees if you, don't, uh, if you don't position yourself in the right way. And I think this is a really, really important strategic thing for all companies to be thinking about this year because all of the indicators are for a massive increase in activity and employees are going to start getting itchy feet and looking for opportunity. Um, so no, ho hopefully that's a cheerful note to end it on. But, uh, but anyway, it looks like a very good year ahead. Um, I'd say thank you to everybody for joining in again um, and listening to us. Hopefully everyone found at least something um, useful to take away. I wish you all happy holidays and uh, uh, an enjoyable 2018. Thank you very much.